Right, morning everyone, um, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are calling in from. Um, welcome to the IED London Climate Action Week event on the Hidden Handbrakes, an open space conversation. The Hidden Handbrakes is a concept that we developed a year and a half or so ago, aimed at exposing the unseen um, and little heard of blockers to climate and social justice um, that exist in the world, that hold damaging um, structures uh, in place. And what this campaign is intended to do, and what our work is intended to do, is surface some of these issues uh, to receive the rightful scrutiny um, that they deserve in order that change can happen. Um, we were very grateful to receive some funding from the Generation Foundation to support us, which continues um, this year. So please, in the back of your minds, when you're having conversations with the experts in the, in the breakout rooms that um, I'll ask to introduce themselves shortly, is that there, there is funding available to support research that aligns with the funders' aims to um, get coverage and greater awareness of the hidden handbrakes that are slowing down the rapid progress that we need in the world. So please do have a conversation with, with, with that in mind. There is the potential for collaborations and partnerships in order to focus on achieving greater awareness and understanding of these hidden handbrakes that are slowing us down. So yes, just a tiny bit of scene setting before I introduce the panelists. So um, the first phase of the campaign was really about um, raising awareness of some of the hidden handbrakes that we'd identified. And we've built a platform on the ID website where any of us can contribute ideas. So please do um, go and have a look at id.org slash hidden handbrakes. Um, which is where you can input your own ideas. Um, with As with most campaigns, we, we've started with an awareness building phase. And now what we'd really like to do is to move into coalition and alliance building phase, which is why I mentioned at the beginning of my, um, my introduction, there, there is funding available to support research that will help us to elicit news coverage, which is the KPI of the funder. So what, you know, there was a big march this week. I think 100,000 people marched to um, Downing Street. It got no coverage. Um, Taylor Swift um, having a selfie with William and the kids got more coverage. So this is what we're fighting against, right? What we're trying to do is help climate change and social justice issues cut through into a news agenda. And I'm very privileged to work with um, Simon Cullen, who's here, and um, John Sharman. Um, in the press team, who are experts in um, and have worked in newsrooms around the world um, and, and editors' offices, uh, as well as written the, the news themselves. So um, we are very well equipped to help take what might seem complicated um, academic messages and make them accessible at the, at the sort of first point of contact uh, i.e. a headline or a subhead before moving into the meat of the actual issue underlying. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to make the work we do as accessible as possible to as broad an audience as possible in order that we can, A, win over hearts and minds, influence a narrative um, uh, towards positive um, change for a thriving world, um, and also to drill down specifically into releasing some of these hidden handbrakes that exist. Without further ado, I would like to introduce the panel, if I may. So we have four world experts from the IED who have worked with us on different um, areas of research, different handbrakes. Um, and first up, uh, uh, it's a delight to introduce Nina Schoenman, who is going to explain a bit about what uh, the discussion that she will lead is going to be about. Over to you, Nina. Thanks so much, James. 
So I'm Nina Schoonman, a researcher at IAD. I work on climate action in cities. And I've actually got a slide I'd like to share with you. So building on James's intro, thank you so much. I'd like to start with a hot story as evidenced by some of the news coverage presented on this slide. Um, so recent research conducted by IAD on the world's biggest capital cities shows that cities the world over are getting hotter and urban residents are increasingly facing extreme and chronic heat. And this isn't just an occasional inconvenience, it's a growing crisis affecting millions. But the impacts of extreme heat are unevenly distributed in cities. The most vulnerable and marginalized communities are hit the hardest. And it's not just a matter of temperature, it's a matter of who is most affected and why. And the uneven impacts of extreme heat in cities that we're seeing throughout this news coverage is just one of the emerging examples of climate change. So during our session, led by myself and my colleague, Anna Walnicki, we'd like to take you behind the scenes of the story of hot cities to explore a number of hidden handbrakes that block climate action at the city level. And you might be wondering, why cities? So firstly, 55% of the global population lives in cities, and this proportion is expected to grow to nearly 70% by mid-century. These population statistics, in and of themselves, make a compelling case. When so much of the global population is affected, focusing on cities is not just an option, it's a necessity. In addition, rapid unplanned urbanization coupled with climate change creates new and complex risks. At the same time, cities are responsible for 70% of global emissions. So this means that we need to start thinking about integrated strategies that simultaneously meet the basic needs of urban populations, build resilience, promote decarbonization, and also contribute to more equitable outcomes. However, there are lots of hidden and not so hidden handbrakes, including a lack of disaggregated data, particularly on low income, informal settlements, exclusionary political processes, siloed approaches, and severe funding constraints, particularly at the local government and community level. So our session is going to focus on these hidden handbrakes at the city level, and I look forward to seeing some of you there. Thanks so much, James. Over to Thank you. you Nina. Thank you, Nina. Great introduction and fabulous slide. Yeah, we were very... Um successful i guess is the way of putting it we're getting a lot of coverage around the world in um india and bangladesh in london um uh and other other nations um because we delivered this work in a timely manner you know just ahead of heat waves occurring around the world so it's the press team skills to sort of understand when is a relevant and timely moment to go out with a story such that it chimes with a press and media agenda um so really good example of how that's worked well in this instance. Moving on, would be great to introduce Ritu Bharadwaj now. Over to you, Ritu. Thanks, James. So I'm Ritu Bharadwaj. I'm the principal researcher with the Climate Change Group at IAD. And I'll be hosting the discussion on how credit rating systems are acting as hidden handbrakes for resilience investment in SITs and LDCs. And much of our work in this space right now is building on some of the work we have done on debt sustainability, uh, both in SITs and LDCs, looking at how layering of debt relief measures might work. But let's talk about sovereign credit rating. And, and I'm sure I was telling James yesterday that I'm not sure many people know about what sovereign credit rating is. So very simply put, uh, credit rating basically provides standardized measure of the likelihood that the borrowing country will be able to meet its financial obligation, such as paying back a loan or a debt. So higher the credit rating, the lower is the perceived risk about investment in a country and vice versa. So, you know, but let's look at what the credit rating industry really is. So it's more than 100 years old. The first entity was Moody's. But, you know, in all of these 100 years, more than 100 years, there are only three big entities which have basically emerged, Moody's, Standard & Poor, and Fitch. And together, these agencies control approximately 95% of the global credit rating market. And over 70% of the rated entities by this big three is in the case, is advanced and emerging economies. And by contrast, if you look at LDCs and SITs, they have a very, they're significantly underrepresented, but it's even more difficult for them to maintain rating. For example, only 13 SITs out of 40 odd SITs that we have actually have rating and even they are 
facing extreme difficulty in maintaining the credit rating because it requires tremendous administrative effort, which can be a huge financial burden for, for these countries. It also means that higher income countries uh, or sovereigns can dedicate more resources towards securing uh, favorable outcomes because they invest a lot in maintaining that effective investor relationships. And, and as a result, LDCs and SITs, they fail to communicate their credit stories effectively. Like even though they might apparently look like a low income country, but still they, they are good enough or like good enough for investors to come and put their money in, into resilience investment and so on. And SITs and LDCs also, you know, they grapple with worrying financial and economic indicators, not because of poor financial management or bad economic policies, but to allow our research has shown that it's climatic impact that, that are really uh, degrading some of the indicators which is being assessed by many of these credit rating entities. And the problem with credit rating entities is that even though some of them have, have mentioned that they do cover climate related impacts, but they, they do not adequately cover it in the, in, the, in the nature in which it is really needed. So by not integrating, or you can say by, by not discounting the impacts of climate events and the associated economic and fiscal consequences that they face, they are really giving an incomplete or biased assessment of the credit worthiness of these countries. So this means that richer countries like United States with a triple A, triple A rating, even though their debt to GDP ratio is at 96%, they are still rated or they can still get uh, investment at a much lower interest rate compared to Barbados, which has a B minus uh, credit rating. And which means that in effect, they cannot invest in resilient infrastructure or disaster preparedness. So in end, I would say like credit rating systems, while it does look essential for global financial architecture, it is inherently unequal and biased. And that can be very counterproductive for most vulnerable nation. And it also underpins this principles of climate justice because many of these nations have contributed least to the climate uh, issues, but they are facing an indirect impact of all of this. So uh, I'll invite you to the discussion that uh, I'll be hosting to understand and unpack some of these issues that are really uh, uh, making this global financial system very unequal for everyone involved. Thank you, Ritu. Yeah, super exciting one and a sort of developing area of, of, of work for us. But it's it's a great example of the sort of baked in structural blockers to change that we want to surface through this campaign and this work. Um, handing over now to Alejandro on subsidies. Thanks, James. Um... So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a researcher, I, I, did, I did our food systems work, and maybe I want to make two points. Why, I'm going to talk about subsidies, and I want to make two points. Why, why handbrakes and why hidden? So let me start with why, why can subsidies be handbrakes? So we, subsidies are essentially transfers of money or public money to private people. And they can be very powerful in shaping people's behavior. And in fact, lots of subsidies are really important for our functioning societies to help poor people, uh, to help farmers. So subsidies are really, really important. But obviously, some, some subsidies are harmful. And so subsidies are, are supporting the wrong thing. So these are the ones that we consider handbrakes. And so the, the, the most well-known ones and most discussed are the, are the uh, fossil fuel subsidies. So we, we, we hear about this a lot. Uh, and obviously, if we want to change our system towards a low carbon economy, then like pumping public money to the hands of people who are exploiting oil and gas, etc., that that is not like a good thing. Maybe less visible are agricultural subsidies, uh, but agriculture is a huge contributor to climate change as well. And there's a lot of money going to agriculture. And again, some of that money is really important because it's helping our farmers. Farmers are, tend to be quite poor across countries, rich and poor countries. And so there is a need to support them. They're producing the food that nurtures us. So we need to make sure that there is the food. So there's a case for subsidies. But the problem arises when the subsidies are supporting the, let's call it the wrong type or the, or the most environmentally destructive kind of agriculture. So this is the bit that, that we think is a real handbrake. And as, as someone I know said once, 
subsidies are, are terrible because, because once you give a subsidy, it's almost impossible to take it back. So they're really baked in. They're really difficult to, to change. Once you start giving public money to someone, they really don't want that to be taken away. So we're looking at agricultural subsidies, but a particular type of agricultural subsidies, which we think are more hidden, which are the subsidies to what we call ultra processed foods. And this is basically all the highly processed food, uh, fast food, uh, microwave foods, all these types of chips, uh, all these types of food that is packaged usually. Um, and when we, when we started looking into the ingredients of those foods, we realized that a lot of those ingredients were really highly subsidized. Um, the biggest one and the biggest biggest subsidy and also the biggest contributor to environmental destruction is meat. And there's meat ingredients across all sorts of these ultra processed uh, foods. But there's also sugar, there's also maize, there's also wheat. So these are highly subsidized and also can be also highly environmentally destructive. Just to give you a sense of the kind of numbers. So we, we, we estimate that roughly something in the neighborhood of like 10 to 40 billion US dollars are spent a year subsidizing these ingredients that go into ultra processed food. To put it in context, the, the whole budget of the World Food Program, which is the, the UN organization that delivers the most essential humanitarian food response is about 20 billion, okay? And they have not managed over the last few years to get more than 8 billion in government contributions. So government contributions to the World Food Program are about 8 billion. And we estimate that these ultra processed food subsidies can be up to 40. So imagine if even a fraction of the money that governments are spending and transferring to these harmful agricultural subsidies would be spent in things that are more worthwhile, less destructive and building better livelihoods. So if you want to hear more about that or discuss it, then come to my group. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Terrific, um, terrific introduction. And last but not least, uh, Tom Mitchell, uh, Executive Director. Um, Tom, over to you. Thank you, James. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I think you've already heard that there are different dimensions to this hidden handbrakes campaign. One is cutting through and hitting the headlines of newspapers. And so we're able to kind of shape public consciousness and pressure from the public around making change. The other is actually revealing the depth of these handbrakes to start with, the kind of the key blockers, uncovering them in some senses, but also getting to grips with some of the complexity and what holds them in place. And so the area that I'm um, looking at here is around sovereign debt. Ritu had already mentioned something about the nature of debt but it's certainly an area that IIED has been exploring a lot in the last two or three years. Um, and what we've come to understand is the level of repayments that are coming from the global south far exceed the level of receipts of money for tackling climate change. So climate finance, in some cases, the statistics are being dwarfed 20 times by the amount of money that's being repaid in debt repayments from countries. And there are several dimensions of debt that are making it much more complicated compared to say 20, 30 years ago, is one that after COVID uh, and after a number of climate emergencies and impacts on different countries, debt is reaching extremely high levels, unsustainable levels of debt, which means countries are really compromising um, their ability to spend money on key public services, for example, or on uh, key uh, social protection schemes and so on. So, you know, in that instance, this level of debt, the debt stocks um, are becoming unmanageable. The second dimension is who's the money owed to? And that's far more fragmented than it was in the last debt crisis, um, largely because we have a mix of uh, private sector, uh, Chinese uh, holders of that debt, um, as well as a mixture of domestic debt, still some bilateral and multilateral debt. And so you've got this complex tapestry of, of countries owing money to um, quite diverse uh, different types of organizations. And often that comes with a degree of geopolitical geopolit influence too. You know, debt holding um, and the level of credit and interest rates is being used as a geopolitical tool to, se to secure certain types of 
of support for those countries. So shifting it becomes even harder. Shifting it becomes not just a, a challenge of, of, for example, growing faster than the interest rates or not just a challenge of, of um, uh, you know, finding cheaper ways to borrow money, but it becomes much more of a negotiation and a geopolitical play, particularly in areas, for example, like the Pacific, where China and the US are, you know, battling it out for control to a certain extent. So actually tackling this debt burden and getting countries back to debt sustainability has been a key feature of IAED's work. Um, and Ritu has been linking um, uh, papers that we've produced in the chat that really does get below the surface of this situation. But fundamentally, we're not going to be able to tackle the climate crisis in the way that we need unless we tackle structurally the issues of the debt burden and debt sustainability challenges that there are in the global south. And if you want to discuss that and look at ways in which we understand that better, but also um, the some of the options um, for, for alleviating debt, then please do come and join the breakout discussion. Thank you, James. Thanks, Tom. That's great. Without further ado, and I'm very much in Juliet's hands here, we will go into the breakout rooms, which I think will be self-selecting. So guest attendees, please do choose your room options when they appear. Welcome back, everybody. Sorry to cut you off mid-flow if somebody was uh, holding forth. And um, please do uh, continue those conversations uh, after the event. But I hope they were interesting and rich and varied. Um, it certainly was in the group that I joined. Um, now I would like to invite room hosts, but also any anybody really, to share thoughts or reflections on on what they heard in their in their group is anyone feeling brave i'm very happy to kick off james i think that, i think one thing that emerged um from the debt group is the kind of connection that there is to some of the other hidden handbrakes as well um and in that respect we did touch on this this idea that if you if you're a country that is is um, experiencing very high debt levels and you actually seek help from the international community to deal with that, your credit rating tends to plummet because it's a sign of distress. And so for a country to actually find help or try and seek help through, for example, the, the common framework of the G20, you actually get penalized. And so in some ways you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. And, and I think the, the kind of connection between the different hidden handbrakes is really starting to emerge for us that, that acknowledges that there is a really embedded, fixed, interconnected system that stacks all of the cards essentially against the countries in most need um, that makes it incredibly difficult to see a kind of an easy pathway out of some of the challenges we're facing. Thanks, Thank Jeff. you, Tom. Thank you very much, Tom. That's super interesting. And uh, is there anybody else? James, I can go next. Thanks, Ritu. Yeah, uh, and why don't you go first? Yeah, sure. I mean, I was listening a lot, so I'm quite happy to respond. Um, I think we had a probably a similar conversation to what uh, Tom was just saying around um, credit credit ratings agencies. Um, what you hear with, with regards to the, the agencies is similar to what you hear with regards to debt in that the when the agencies come in and provide a rating for a country, it per perpetuates global inequality, really, uh, because countries that have the least ability to build their own economies are given persistent bad ratings. And then it just kind of continues in that way. Um, and we were also seeing um, one of the other colleagues in the room was commenting that this has similarities with other global systems. So things like uh, philanthropy. So global philanthropies will react in a similar way to, to giving money to communities on the ground, for example, if they, if they aren't trustworthy enough, for example. Uh, the, the other thing that they mentioned was um, about uh, how the systems are kind of set up by sort of all the same people, really. Um, so, I mean, 
these are my words, not theirs, but I mean, I took it to mean that sort of global credit rating systems and many others that we all work in and exist in around sustainable development and climate change is all a bit male, pale and stale. And I think we need to get away from that. Thank you, Anne. And just to build on Anne's point, talking to or listening to Ritu talking about the issue, it reminded me of the LIBOR rate setting scandal that happened in the UK about 10 years ago, I think it was, where it was based on subjective and often unfair conversations by people who were essentially trying to further the interests of their own bank or their own bonuses rather than what's best for the uh, market itself. And I think that aspect of subjectivity is something that absolutely the Hidden Handbrake um, Research Fund, which exists, just to remind you, could be focusing on. So how do we make the processes or lack of processes by which some of these decisions are made more transparent and open to um, scrutiny. Thank you, Anne. Anybody else? I'll just add one more point to that, James, um, and something that Lily raised, and Lily, I don't know whether you would want to come in and say that, but it was something around peer review. So, uh, you know, right now, because of this oligopoly, uh, three entities dominating the whole market, there is like homogeneous product, there's not enough innovation, and kind of it's that's the same system that they have put in place. It the same has perpetuated and it does not allow for any uh, innovation. So something that Lily highlighted was why not have peer review? Uh, and I thought that was a that's a use, very useful idea. Uh, but things like that can only emerge if we create the market uh, in a way that people start valuing each other's uh, assessment. Thank you, Riti. OK, we've heard from the debt and credit ratings teams. Anything from... Can I go next with you? Please do. Yeah, thanks, Alejandro. Yeah, no, just very briefly, because we, the, 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 on subsidies, the, the, the kind of conversation and just the makeup of the room kind of reflected how diverse and multi-scale and multifaceted subsidies are. So there were no two people in the room who kind of had the same interest or approach. And I think that in itself is quite informative. Uh, but a couple of interesting emerging thoughts that I think would be worth kind of picking up. One is on the question of how do we deal with this ingrained thing so difficult to change? Actually, I think there's appetite to like know more about them. I think people just don't know about them. People don't and, and they don't know the scale of them. And so I think maybe there's the first kind of thing to do is to just point out the enormous scale of subsidies. Uh, and not just of like money transferred or changing hands, but just tax breaks, all the things that are basically like public money at stake. Um, and, and we talk from fossil fuels to farmer subsidies in Ethiopia to uh, oil exploitation in, in Guyana. And I think the connecting thing around those is appetite to like understand like how big these things are. And also the realization they're not always harmful, but to understand in what case they are harmful and like pointing that out and trying to, to change it. So, so I think that's, it was an interesting, uh, and a reminder of this that, that you know we we this effort of producing this type of information actually you know more please i think was the conclusion thank you so much alejandro and i'm really pleased you spoke to the sort of awareness raising as a lever for change in its own right um which is exactly the intent of the of the funding that we have to do research that supports your areas of work but that has a potential media friendly outcome or headline at the end of it Joe, welcome. Thank you. Uh, just, just to mention one of the things that we can't lose sight of, and that, those are the elephants in the rooms in every one of these countries. And they're the self-reinforcing feedback loops from the government who are, are having the skids greased under the table in the case of Guyana, no doubt from ESSO, Exxon. Uh, in the Mekong, the four countries I'm working in, there's a fantastic recently published uh, article on corruption in those countries. Uh, so, you know, we have to be very much aware that there's something going on underneath that we're not seeing at all. In Asia, it's institutionalized, it's, it's perfected. In Latin America, it's very clumsy, but it still goes on. So how do we deal with those sort of things? 
uh, and not lose sight of them. Thank you, Joe. Very important to name all elephants in the room, absolutely, in order to have an honest um, debate and discussion. Thank you. Any reflections from the unjust transition discussion? I can summarise if you want, unless Nina, unless you want to do it. I can do it very quickly. Thank you, Anna. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. So obviously heat was the entry point, um, but really it was an opportunity for us to talk about the ongoing need for disaggregated data, um, more decentralised finance and um, more joined up approaches to climate change and, and social justice in cities. That's something that we've been talking about for a really long time. Um, and I guess we also just started to unpack beyond the kind of the big numbers around heat in cities, um, when you take a more intersectional approach, a more nuanced approach to understanding how the impacts of climate change are, are affecting different different people, um, implications for gender, um, thinking about socioeconomic distribution. Um, so I guess, yeah, we were just start, starting to get into the, into the nitty gritty of it all really, um, but it was really nice to, um, it was really nice to, get, to begin a new conversation with, with three people that we never spoken to before, so that was great. Thank you, Anna. That's exactly the purpose of this um, session, so I'm, I'm delighted that um, new, new connections are being made. Simon, I'm going to pick on you, if you don't mind, because um, the media angle is hugely important to this campaign. We've heard from Alejandro. Um, how important it is to continue to raise awareness of some of these hidden issues and we just heard from Anna there that the sort of the access point is cities are getting hotter and then there's a wealth of information underneath that sort of um, enables you to explore in more detail what the implications of that are for different sections of society different 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 people in different circumstances have you heard anything in the rooms that you were visiting that um, you would like to share um, so I didn't get around to all rooms. I think that one of the um, the things that in in the the main room that I stayed in was about the issue of a lot of the time people just don't see what's going on uh, because as Alejandro has said, uh, it's not about money changing hands. It's about like the subsidies, for example, just foregone tax revenue, and so for the most part. Uh, the public doesn't see what happens. And likewise, with a lot of these handbrakes, there is just the invisibility to the public about them. So it's partly about raising the, uh, showing people where the money flows are going. Um, and then, you know, and then putting some some data out there just to show the significance of it. And let the public have that debate about whether it's something that um, if it's something that taxpayers and the public are happy with, I, I suspect in many cases it's not, but they just don't know what's going on. Um, you know, you look at these international treaties around fossil fuel compensation uh, issues. Uh, now, $80 billion went to fossil fuel companies in compensation because governments are trying to in introduce climate policies. Now, I just don't think that's on the agenda of a lot of people. So it's really about raising the awareness of these topics because I think that's when people will care. Because, you know, imagine, for example, where that money could be better spent uh, if um, communities were able to allocate it themselves or, you know, knew that it was, it was an issue. So, yeah, I think... Um, there's a lot of work to be done in terms of raising the profile of some of these handbrakes. Terrific. Thank you so much, Simon. Right. Is there anything else that people would like to share or add before we wrap up? I can see contributions in the chat. Thank you. Can't see any. James, I think it would be useful for us to just discuss this point about corruption. Um, again, because I think this is one of the topics that is, you know, most um, commonly raised um, when we come to talk about the financial system and the um, the the reasons why the financial system is like it is and it's not helping uh, developing countries or the global south. And uh, you know, even from those regions, there is a sense that look, why would you put your money at risk when there is 
uh, a chance of corruption or that, that money falling into the wrong hands. But that has almost become the de facto argument for why nothing happens always. It's easy to say, yeah, well, why would you do that? There's too much corruption. And I do think that there is a system at the moment where we've almost developed such a, a kind of a trope or a mantra around corruption that even the perception indexes and the way we analyze it almost reinforce this suggestion that actually the money will fall into the wrong hands. Now, I'm not denying that there aren't aspects of corruption, but there are aspects of corruption in every country, for better or worse. Um, including in many of the countries in the global north who are, in a sense, lecturing others about the fact that they haven't done enough on corruption. So I think in that sense, the UK has just been burning its giant stacks of PPE um, that had been sourced through some of the most corrupt contracts that there have been around. So in that sense, I think we need to be careful that the arguments about corruption do not dominate and equally I think it's important maybe in the next hidden handbrakes research is to understand the way in which corruption indexes or assessments of corruption actually become another handbrake on not doing anything about some of the more structural challenges that we face. Um, so I think it's a really interesting one as a topic for research as well and would like to put that on the agenda for, for us to consider in future. Fabulous. Thank you, Tom. I don't know if anyone else would like to read you. Go ahead. Uh, thanks, and I'll just build on what Tom said. See, corruption is one issue that cuts across all the, the topics that we discussed today, because a big in, big weightage, if I just talk about uh, the, de uh, the credit rating, a big weightage is given on governance, and where corruption really comes out as a big uh, indicator, is a lot of weightage assigned, again, a very subjective indicator. Uh, but if you look at some of the indicators that are typically used, like corruption perception index um, and uh, governance effectiveness index. So a lot of these indexes are available, but one really needs to go dig deeper into what are the indicators used. Again, it's it's the way some of these, who has constructed these indexes? Uh, who, who has defined what weightages are given to different aspects within that? These are the things that th they are the ones that are the culprit, which makes some entities look good and some look bad. For example, as I was giving this, this thing about debt to GDP ratio, US 96%. The same 96% debt to GDP ratio would look like going into debt distress for any other country in the global south. If Ethiopia or Uganda had debt to GDP ratio above 95, they would say, IMF would say, oh, they're heading towards debt distress. Whereas US gets triple A rating, why? Because there's so many other subjective parameters, which, which like, you know, which around governance index and around corruption perception and all of that, that really uh, like undermines, even though uh, undermines the effectiveness, you know, or the parameters against which they get scaled. And despite there being evidence that some of the impact investing has given much better return to investors, but just because you know, there's some yardsticks being used, which do not, uh, you know, favor some of the poorer countries, is where they, they get stuck. So um, that's my pitch on this issue. Thank you so much, Ritu. Thank you, Ritu. Richard, would you like to name this one? I think, I think, certainly, I mean, you know, having worked on, on climate change for a while, we did see a sort of lull in <clears throat> climate denial, um, I guess, in the period up to COVID, but it does seem to have sort of resurged. I think perhaps social media, perhaps also the populist politics um, that sort of emerged, particularly across Europe. Um, but um, clearly, you know, I mean, there were some good reports about the sort of covert funding from sort of fossil fuel companies and right-wing think tanks into into climate denial and sort of promoting it it does seem to be resurging and and also i think i mean i've kind of noticed um there's a sort of deployment of sort of voices from the global south basically saying that you know why would you want to deny us the poverty reducing benefits of fossil fuels and we need them and you're all sort of neo-colonialist oppressors for trying to force us to 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 switch to renewables despite all the evidence we know about renewables being cheaper and not not killing millions of people every year with respiratory disease and all those other things 
Um, but it does seem to be, um, it, I mean, I think the activity, even if you look at the UK Parliament, you look at the uh, the EU targets that have just been drawn back from um, in the face of sort of uh, the, the, the EU elections. I think it's something that, you know, we sort of perhaps got a bit complacent. We thought it had all gone away and that the argument was clear. The science was absolutely undeniable. But I think perhaps we were a bit optimistic on that score. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, very important contribution. And um, yes, it is um, poisoning the well, really, of uh, informed and transparent and honest debate um, that malign influences sort of spew out their nonsense across social media channels and people, um, some people absorb it. Anne, go ahead. And Andy, bye. Nice to see you. Thanks so much for joining us. Go ahead, Anne. Thanks. Um, I just thought that, you know, I as the marketing manager, I felt like this was a good opportunity to speak. And I just want, I was really pleased that someone from Christ, Christian Aid, an NGO, was here saying that, because I feel like having had this conversation, it really shows to me that IID is really well positioned to be able to do the research that then backs up the advocacy that organizations like Christian Aid and Save the Children, I think is on the call as well, organizations like that who are out there campaigning and doing really good advocacy work. I think if we have this research that is, you know, testable and verifiable, then that that that's really fantastic. And I think this has been a really good conversation. So I just want Thank to- Thank you so much, Anne. You, could, you couldn't have outroed better, I think, you know, the purpose here is collaboration and um, ID has been producing world-class evidence for 50, over 50 years now. And we're very, very keen to work with other organisations that are excellent at advocating in certain spaces in order to take the findings of that research to wider audiences in order to all work together on um, pulling the levers that will unlock the problems that we've been talking about. So um, I would like to thank you all for your time today. Please do um, carry on the conversation with us. Go and have a look at the ID website. There's a hidden handbrakes page. If you if you want to contribute to those, it's a very simple um, sort of two or three step process to, to input your hidden handbrake. And please do get in touch with us if there's any ideas for work in the spaces that you've heard about or other other hidden handbrake work. And we'll be um, we'll be able to follow up with you to explore that further. So thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. Special thanks to our panellists for their contributions and, and to all our guests. Thank you so much. Have a good afternoon.